Thank you for joining with us. We continue our series through the Gospel of Matthew. We're looking at Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. And I've entitled my message, The Tale of Two Traps. You know, when a church needs a pastor today, typically they form what is called a pastoral search committee. And that committee is to investigate possible candidates that might be suitable for the job. In fact, a pastoral search committee will often write a letter to the national headquarters of their particular denomination. And they'll ask for several names of potential candidates that might uh, be someone that they would interview. Someone once suggested what it would be like if some of the characters of the Bible were interviewed uh, for the job. What, were the, what would the response to their resume look like if some of these men of the Bible were considered candidates for a pastoral position today? Noah has 120 years of experience preaching, but no converts. Moses, he stutters. Former congregation says he loses his temper over trivialities. Abraham took off to Egypt during hard times. We heard he got into trouble with the authorities and tried to lie his way out. David, unacceptable moral character, might have been considered for the minister of music had he not fallen. Solomon, reputation for wisdom, but he doesn't practice what he preaches. Elijah, inconsistent, known to fold and even run away under pressure. Hosea, home in shambles, divorced, married to a prostitute. Jeremiah, too emotional and alarmist. He often offends people. Amos, no training, uh, suited only as a fig, pick, fig, uh, fig picker. John the Baptist lacks any tact. Uh, his hair is too long and he dresses kind of weird. Peter, bad temper and was overheard denying Christ. Paul travels too much, preaches too long. Some have been known to fall asleep during his sermons. Timothy has some potential, but he's too young for the job. Judas, practical, cooperative, good with money. He cares for the poor. The search committee agrees that he's just the man for our church. <laughs> you know, committees can sometimes be dangerous. Uh, someone once said that a camel is a horse put together by a committee. <laughs> but in our passage here this morning, we discover another search committee of sorts. It's a committee made up of the religious leaders of Israel. And their assignment is to look for the evidence that qualifies Jesus uh, to be the Messiah. But the big problem with this committee is that they've already decided against him. This leadership team has already rejected him. Uh, they don't like the resume of Jesus at all. Why? Because this candidate is the real thing. And he poses a, a major problem to their religious positions and their political uh, ambitions. And so this committee comes to Jesus here in Matthew chapter 16 with a challenge. Verse 1. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. But he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And a sign will not be given it, except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. You know, it's interesting to note here that the Pharisees and the Sadducees represent both the conservative and the liberal leaders of Israel at that time. Here we have both political and religious parties. And while the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated each other, they joined forces against Christ. Why? Uh, where were these leaders really coming from? Well... Let me give you a little background on these guys. First of all, we have the Pharisees. The Pharisees, uh, that word Pharisee actually means separatist. And these were the ultra-conservative political and religious leaders. And they numbered about 6,000 in Israel at that time. But contrary to what you might think, not everything about the Pharisees and what they stood for was, was bad. The positive characteristics of the group was the fact that they were committed to obeying God's word. That's good. They were admired by the people as, as uh, basically for their apparent piety. And they believed in the bodily resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in demons. They believed in eternal life. They literally believed in a heaven and a hell. 
And so in many ways, the Pharisees, well, they had their theological ducks in a row. In fact, most of us might identify with much of what the Pharisees stood for. Their official statement of faith actually sounded pretty good. However, they had a darker flip side. The negative characteristics of the Pharisees include the fact that, first of all, they acted as if their own religious rules for living were just as important as the Word of God. Secondly, they were often hypocritical in that they tried to force others to live to standards uh, that they themselves could not live up to. And thirdly, they believed salvation came from perfect obedience to the Mosaic Law, which was absolutely impossible to do. On top of that, they ignored God's message of mercy and grace. And they were more concerned with appearing good, to look good on the outside, than they were with obeying God. And so Jesus told the disciples, stay away from the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 14, Jesus said, let them alone. <laughs> let them be. They are blind guides. Blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, they both fall into the pit. And so Jesus points out here that the Pharisees were spiritually blind and they were eternally lost. And then there are the Sadducees. The Sadducees were sad, you see. Uh, the Sadducees were a smaller group of liberal uh, religious leaders in that particular day. And the positive characteristics of the Sadducees was the fact that they believed in God's word, but they limited it to just the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were much more practically minded than the Pharisees. They were more down to earth. However, the negative characteristics of the Sadducees include the fact that they relied only on logic. They placed very little value or importance on faith. And they did not believe that all the Old Testament was the Word of God. In other words, they treated God's Word like a smorgasbord. <laughs> they picked and chose what they liked to believe and what they didn't want to believe. We have people today who do the same thing, don't we? Uh, they pick and choose what they want to believe in the Bible. And if they like it, uh, they embrace it. But if it's not politically correct, or if it doesn't jive with their own lifestyle, well, they throw it out. That's called taking the salad bar approach uh, to Scripture in order to justify our own ideas and our prejudices. Someone put it this way. Once you accept in principle that Scripture may be wrong in parts, you start performing surgery on the text. You sort out certain historical details and you stack them in a pile marked believable. And then label the rest unbelievable and then you dump them out. But scripture is not a beanbag chair. It cannot be reshaped to fit individual tastes. We must accept the total message. Otherwise, all we're doing is remaking Jesus and his message to fit our own personal biases and prejudices. I totally agree. Picking the contents of your salad is one thing, but picking and choosing among God's word is a recipe for disaster. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God. That word inspired is theonoustos. God breathed. All scripture is God breathed, is inspired by God. Not just the parts that you may like or not like. In other words, we can't pick and choose when it comes to God's Word. The Apostle Peter uh, explains in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, that above all, you must understand that no, no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Again, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All scripture is inspired by God. Now since the Sadducees liked to pick and choose, they rejected certain really important doctrinal uh, biblical truths like the bodily resurrection. They didn't like that idea. The reality of angels and demons, and they threw that out. Even the hope of eternal life. They did not believe in a literal heaven or hell. Pharisees. Sadducees. Jesus would reserve his strongest words against these two groups of religious leaders. Why? Because as religious leaders, they were leading others down the same dead-end path. John 8, 44, Jesus tells these leaders, 
You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's will or desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, he adds, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much of a son of hell as yourselves. Wow. Now those are strong words. Jesus vehemently opposed these religious leaders. And so again, while the Pharisees and Sadducees hated each other, they joined forces against Jesus. Despite their doctrinal differences, they agreed with their common opposition to Christ. Why? Because again, Jesus was a major threat to both their religious position and also their political ambitions. And so here in verse 1, we have just one of a series of conflicts where Christ is challenged by his enemies. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, the implication here is that the previous miracles that Jesus were doing were not from heaven. Uh, they were discrediting his earthly miracles. And so they were basically asking Jesus to th give them a sign that was more spectacular than his healings. Maybe, they wanted, maybe what they really wanted to see was fire coming down from heaven like Elijah had done. Or maybe what they wanted to witness was bread coming down as manna from heaven uh, like Moses had done. But you know, since they had already rejected him, it really would, would have made no difference at all. They uh, would explain away a sign in the heavens by their own twisted reasoning. And like so many people today, we uh, have all the evidence for the existence of God and the reality of who Jesus Christ really is. But many people just shrug it off and say, hey, uh, you know what? Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's already made up. Someone once put it this way. There is nothing more resourceful than the human mind justifying its own sin. Isn't that true? That's the dark part of our sin nature. We can justify and we can rationalize just about anything if we choose to do so. We have that capability as a part of our sin nature. But since Jesus obviously knows uh, about the religious leaders, he refuses to take their challenge. Why? Because they've already rejected him, uh, even with all the past miracles. And so he refuses to be the kind of circus performer who will entertain them with a good show. He refuses to paint pictures for blind men. And that's what they are, blind guys. In fact, he illustrates their spiritual blindness here in verse 2. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, well, today it's going to be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. I remember as a Boy Scout, uh, I only made it to Tenderfoot, <laughs> but uh, I remember the old adage that was uh, told to us uh, Boy Scouts, uh, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. The red color of the sky will often tell you what kind of weather it's going to be like that day. Jesus points out here to these religious leaders that while they can forecast what the weather will be like from the physical signs in the sky, they had been surrounded by spiritual signs all around them related to the person of Jesus Christ, and they missed it all. And now they want something even more and more spectacular. But Jesus points out here in verse 4 that it is a wicked and adulterous generation that looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. Jesus refuses to give them any more evidence. He refuses to continue to cast his pearls before swine. In fact, Jesus described their spiritual condition here in three different ways. First of all, they were spiritually blind. And that while they were able to interpret things that were physical and earthly, they could not see spiritual signs, any spiritual signs around them. Secondly, they were wicked. Why? Because they tempted God. And thirdly, they were adulterous. That word adulterous suggests that they were spiritually unfaithful to God. How? By their empty religious formality and by the rejection of the Messiah. And so for them to demand another miraculous sign from Jesus proves really the bankruptcy of their faith. They will never be satisfied. We pointed out last time how uh, 
Interest in miracles is on the rise these days. In fact, polls tell us that over 90% of all Americans today believe in miracles. Most people have either witnessed a miracle or they know someone who has experienced a miracle. In fact, miracles kind of have a way of dazzling people like the 4th of July fireworks. People get really excited, they get really pumped up when they witness a real genuine miracle. But I sometimes wonder if uh, maybe miracles aren't what they're cracked up to be or what we've cracked them up to be. Even Jesus here, the miracle worker himself, occasionally seemed less than enthusiastic about miracles. Why? Well, here in verse 4 he states, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign. Author Chris Lutz puts it this way, both the devout and the skeptic might ooh and ah at the exploding spectacle before them, but then when the glorious miracle fades, the crowd invariably grows restless for more and more and more. That somehow, seem, somehow seems to be uh, really a part of our, our human nature. John tells us in his gospel, in John chapter 2, verse 23, many believed in his name, that is, many believed in Jesus' name, beholding his signs, which he was doing, but Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. Why? Because he knew all men. Jesus knew people. He knew their hearts. He knew their desires. He knew the minute he pulled the plug on miracles, they would take off. He knew that. He knew their hearts. Philip Yancey, in his book, Disappointment with God, points out how it is the same thing uh, in the Old Testament. We discover it there. He says, what happened during those days almost defies belief. When Moses climbed the sacred mountain, storming with the signs of God's presence, those people who had lived through the ten plagues of Egypt, who had crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, who had drunk water from a rock, who were digesting the miracle of manna in their stomachs at that very moment, those same people got bored, impatient, or rebellious, or jealous, and apparently forgot all about God. And by the time Moses descended from the mountain, they were dancing like heathens around a golden calf. Yancey points out, God did not play hide-and-seek with the Israelites. They had every proof of his existence that you could possibly ask for. But astonishingly, God's directness seemed to produce the very opposite of the desired effect. The Israelites responded not with worship and love, but with fear and open rebellion. God's visible presence did nothing to improve lasting faith. That's basically the situation we find here in Matthew chapter 16. For these faithless religious leaders, any sign, any miracle that Jesus uh, would have done would never have been enough. Never. And knowing that, the only sign that Jesus offers is the old story they all knew from the Old Testament, the sign of the prophet Jonah. Back in Matthew chapter 12, he told them the same thing. He said, no sign shall be given it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus takes that historical event from the Old Testament and he infuses it with all new meaning. The story of Jonah emerging from the fish after three days and three nights is a type. It's a sign that foreshadows the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day. And so just like Jonah was in a tomb of sorts, three days and three nights in the belly of that great fish, so also Jesus will be three days and three nights in the tomb. It was absolutely amazing and appropriate that Jesus affirms this Old Testament account of Jonah as analogous to his own death, his own burial, and his own resurrection. And in other words, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead will be the future supreme sign. The only visible sign that any generation will ever need, uh, basically for repentance and faith, is the one that God revealed through his Son, the resurrection hope. It was the resurrection which proved once and for all that Jesus is who he claims to be, the very incarnation of all truth. And that's really the only miracle or any sign that we need, and it requires faith. It is our faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ that is now required. Now, beginning here in verse 5, we have a caution. Uh, Christ warns the disciples in verse 5. And the disciples came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began to discuss among themselves, saying, It is because we took no bread. 
But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak of you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The disciples were apparently more concerned about physical things than they were spiritual. And while Jesus was cons considering the sad state of the religious leaders, the disciples here were irritated because they had forgotten to bring along enough bread. Jesus explains that he's not referring to their lack of bread. In fact, he mildly rebukes them for their lack of faith. If they needed bread, why couldn't they just trust him, trust him to provide it? I mean, after all, he points out he had just fed 4,000 with just a, a few loaves and a couple of fish. What Jesus is talking about is spiritual things, the leaven, the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. While the disciples here were only thinking about physical bread. In other words, food was not the issue. Jesus could take care of that. He proved that. The real problem was the danger of the kind of dry, moldy, and crusty bread that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were dishing out. And his clear warning is spelled out here in verse 6. Watch out. Beware of the leaven or the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other words, their evil teaching was like a pervasive yeast penetrating and corrupting the entire nation of Israel. You know, by way of application, I'm convinced that we need to be warned here as well. What was the evil teaching that Jesus here was talking about? You know, while the Pharisees and the Sadducees were long, are long gone, I'm convinced that their evil teachings are alive and well in the church today. In fact, I'm absolutely convinced that as we navigate the Christian life, there will be two main traps that as believers we can so easily fall into. Two main traps. The first trap is the trap of legalism. That was the deadly snare of the Pharisees. What is legalism? Well, Webster defines legalism as the abiding by the strict literal adherence to the law or to a particular religious or moral code. Legalism is a pit that many good, well-meaning Christians have fallen into. It's having that self-righteous attitude solely based upon keeping this big list of do's and don'ts that really has nothing to do with what the Bible says. It's reflected that old pious saying that you've heard about the self-righteous man who bragged, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I don't chew, and I don't go with girls that do. I remember my grandmother wonderful godly woman who once told me when I was 10 years old I was playing cards on the kitchen table and my grandmother walked by and she said Bradley cards are the devil's tools and then she walked away <laughs> I remember feeling a tremendous sense of guilt and shame and all I was playing was uno <laughs> I look back and I think that my blessed grandmother may have been a wee bit legalistic when it came to playing cards in every other way my my grandmother was a saint I love her but that's just one small example of the kind of man-made rules we impose as a measure of spirituality. In my grandparents' generation, the man-made church rules were against, against things like maybe wearing makeup or dancing or going to movies or playing pool or wearing dresses any shorter than two inches below your knee. In my own parents' generation, the man-made church rules were against things like drinking or smoking body piercings, maybe wearing tattoos. If you called yourself a Christian, there, in certain circles, there were certain things that you just did not do. I read recently, for example, how even today on the books in Blackwater, Kentucky, tickling a woman under her chin with a feather duster while she's in church carries a penalty of $10 and a day in jail. No one can eat unshelled roasted peanuts while attending church in Idana, Oregon. In Honey Creek, Iowa, no one is permitted to carry a slingshot to church unless you're a policeman. No citizen in Lee Creek, Arkansas is allowed to attend church in any red colored garment. Can't wear red. Swinging a yo-yo in church or anywhere in public in the, on the Sabbath is prohibited in Studley, Virginia. <laughs> 
Turtle races are not permitted within 100 yards of a local church at any time in Slaughter, Louisiana. Now, those are just plain silly. But most legalism today are unwritten expectations. You won't find them written down. Theologically speaking, it might be what kind of church you belong to, whether or not you've been baptized in a certain way, whether or not you've spoken in tongues, or do you use real wine and, or maybe just grape juice in your communion cup. I referred to, uh, to this a few weeks ago as uh, waypoint spirituality. It's so easy for us to fall into the trap of judging the spiritual condition of others based upon the certain waypoints along the way. What do they look like? What do they do? What do they not do? According to our own arbitrary standards of behavior. Chuck Swindoll points out, he says, the bite of legalism spreads paralyzing venom into the body of Christ. Its poison blinds our eyes, dulls our edge, and arouses pride in our hearts. Soon our love is eclipsed as it turns into a mental clipboard with a long checklist. 1 Samuel 16, 7 makes it clear when it says, God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, and by the way, he's often impressed. But the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus severely warns us of the deadly danger of legalism. In fact, the strongest words Jesus ever spoke in all the Gospels were against the legalists. He called the legalist religious leaders of his day whitewashed tombs, <laughs> clean and lily white on the outside, but dead men's bones on the inside. At least on three occasions, he called them a brood of vipers. That's like calling someone snakes in the grass. And over a dozen times in the gospel, he calls them hypocrites. The word hypocrite simply means to wear a mask. Jesus did not have nice things to say about legalism or the legalists. Why? Because the legalism of the letter of the law kills the spirit. God does not want us to live like that. As the Apostle Paul puts it, the Lord who has made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You know, just like a cancer, it can grow, it can destroy the faith and joy of an entire church. Legalism is a cancer, a spiritual cancer. In fact, the entire uh, letter to the Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul expressly for the purpose of addressing the deadly disease of legalism in the church. And he blasts those who would make the Christian life merely a matter of outward conformity and good works. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul writes, A man is not justified by the works of the law, but through Christ, through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so by trying to keep a big rigid list uh, of rules and regulations can never, can never make us right before God. Never. On top of that, legalism makes us inflexible. It makes us rigid. And again, God does not want us to live like that. He calls us to something greater. Now there's a second trap. And the second trap, listen, is just as deadly as the first one. The second trap that we can easily fall into is the trap of licentiousness. Now, this is just the opposite of legalism. Uh, Webster defines licentiousness as lacking moral discipline or ignoring legal restraint. In other words, it's having no regard for accepted rules or standards. And so, here we have just the opposite problem. It's coming to the conclusion that as a believer, I have a license to sin. James Bond had a license to kill. <laughs> I have a license to sin. After all, Listen, I'm forgiven, right? All my sins, past, present, and future. I have the assurance of my salvation. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. So I'm free to do whatever I want to do, right? Wrong. <laughs> it's crystal clear in the Bible that this too is a lie straight from the pit. In fact, the attitude and practice of licentiousness is just as dangerous, just as deadly to the church as legalism. It's another form of cancer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls licentiousness cheap grace. What is cheap grace? He points out true grace justifies the sinner, whereas cheap grace justifies the sin. 
The Apostle Paul asked the question in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? <laughs> may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? The answer is obviously we can't. In fact, we are called to live a holy life. We're called to be holy. Ephesians 1, 4, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Listen, we are called to live our lives in obedience. But at the same time, the Bible makes it clear that the Christian life is not essentially or simply a code of ethics to live by. It's not merely some philosophical or ethical lifestyle that we follow. It's first and foremost a living, dynamic, love relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. And that is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Our motivation to obedience is because we love the Lord. We desire to please Him, not because of some moral obligation or moral duty, which leads us to dry religiosity and some dead orthodoxy. No, that was essentially the problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so how do we keep from falling into either the trap of legalism on the one hand or into the trap of licentiousness on the other? How do we do that? I think the Apostle Paul sums it up best in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now, walking in the Spirit is not some emotional experience detached from everyday life. It is the daily experience of the believer who feeds on the Word prays and obeys what the Bible says. To walk in the Spirit means to have our daily lives under His control, which means we live under the direction of the Holy Spirit founded securely upon the Word of God. To be led by the Spirit means to be delivered from a life of bondage, either to legalism on the one hand or licentiousness on the other. Again, Paul says, I, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The flesh. Paul, Paul refers uh, this to the fallen nature that is within every believer. As believers, we understand that we are saved souls, but we're in unsaved bodies. We're still weak. We're still vulnerable. We're still frail. We're still prone to sin. It's like the old hymn. Prone to sin, oh Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We have that proneness in us. In other words, we still have a conflict going on with our two natures. C.S. Lewis describes the battle that every Christian is like uh, experiencing. It's like a black dog and a white dog that are fighting. The one that gets bigger, the one that wins, is the dog you feed. So which dog are you feeding? <laughs> which one are you uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to control? Now as believers, we do have an unfair advantage. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and this battle uh, he can win through us. We win the battle by learning to walk in the Spirit one step at a time. And so, as you walk, let me encourage you this week, uh, watch who you walk with, <laughs> making sure that you're listening to the voice of grace. It's all about grace. Spend time in His Word. Claim the, the wonderful promises that He has made uh, to you about who you really are in Christ. You're a child of God, filled with His Spirit. Avoid the danger of tripping over your own shoestrings uh, by falling into the trap of legalism or licentiousness. Remember, it is God's presence and God's Spirit in you, His power to live the life He calls you to live. It, I, I like the prayer of one honest man. He prays this. He says, so far today, God, I've done all right. So far today, I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy or grumpy, or nasty, or self-centered. I'm really glad about that, God. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed, and then, Lord, I'm going to need help for the rest of the day. <laughs> what are the deeds of the flesh that we're called to avoid? Galatians 5.19 spells it out. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which 
I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by Spirit. Now, there is the key. It's walking by the Spirit in obedience to His Word out of a motivation of love for our Savior. That's what it's all about. Now, here's the great spiritual paradox. Our freedom in Christ comes only through obedience. Let me say that again. Our freedom in Christ comes only through obedience. We are servants of Christ who gives us choices and allows us to make responsible decisions within the boundaries of love and freedom from sins, power, and guilt. At the same time, there's real joy, there's blessing in being holy. To be holy means to be separate from the world, set apart. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. May we daily walk in His Spirit as we seek to serve Him. May, may we have the prayer of King David. May that be our prayer as well. Where he says in Psalm 19, 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, I part throughout the universe display. And sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou Savior God to thee, how great thou 